This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The idea of being able to fly by ourselves seems something of a fantasy, but today I'm going to meet a man that has managed to do that, fly by himself. He straps a thousand horsepower to his back and reaches speeds of 85 miles per hour. Razor is a huge amount of fun because I myself have a science background and I, in those days, was really focused on one tiny area of engineering. But what I love about being on Razor is I get to tap into lots of different areas of science, which means I get to learn all the time and communicate what I'm learning to others and share my enthusiasm for what I'm learning with other people. This is a cloud chamber? This is a cloud chamber. And so what you're looking at here are different types of particles interacting all around us. It's also a way of getting smarter and also realising that our, the quality of our life is based on the work that scientists and technologists are doing. They're advancing human experience through technology. And I just find that absolutely fascinating. I mean, the stories I've covered on the show a really high level physics usually, and we get to tell it in a really fun way, often through a journey. Dark matter is a great example of that. And we get to travel, we get to see things that most people will never get the chance to see. I mean, what could be better than that? So this is light? Yes. So the sphere is essentially the big vessel with the argon in it. It looks very colourful. What are the colours representing? So every time you see one of them light up, it means they detected something. So which colour corresponds to dark matter? There is no specific colour. The only thing that might tell me is this plot up here. If oh, yeah. the dark matter particles would be far higher up in the plot. Oh, wow. So this is the plot that could actually significantly change should you find dark yeah. matter. Yeah. The show's called Razor because it's based on not only the fact that we cover very cutting edge technology on the show, but William of Ockham in the 14th century was a philosopher who believed that the most simple solutions were the best. And he was trying to prove the existence of God. And God being the most simple explanation to everything. And so based on his philosophies, we've called the show Racer because we try and communicate science in the most simple but effective way. Just 5% of the matter in our universe, things like stars, planets, galaxies, you and me are visible. The rest, the other 95% is invisible, but it's been called dark matter and dark energy. But the question of exactly what that is has been baffling scientists and astronomers for decades. But what if the answers were not up there, but right here on Earth? I'm going to delve deep, really deep, to find out more. The toughest razor story I've done would probably be dark matter, but not because it was unpleasantly tough. It was more that the concept of going two kilometres underground was a bit scary to begin with. And then when I got down there, I realised that it was just an amazing story to cover. It was cold um, and I think it wasn't, it wasn't the weather and it wasn't um, the complexity of the science that we were covering. It was more the concept of going deep underground. And, you know, all of the fears that come with that. How do I get out quickly? Will there be any emergencies? Any things that could go wrong? And let's face it, the idea of having two kilometers of rock sitting on top of you isn't the most comfortable idea. 
just seems to be getting darker and darker. Luckily, we only have to walk 1.5 kilometers to reach the facility. It is so hot down here. Yes, you have to get acclimatized. We were given gum just before we went into the lift and it's to help with the pressure differences. It's a bit like taking off in a plane when your ears pop. The same thing happened going down in the lift. We're just going in a different direction. Here we are. Woo. Absolutely every bit of kit that we're taking with us has had to be meticulously wiped over and it's taken a while. I mean, we got the lift at 6 a.m. It's now 8.30 and all of that time has been spent walking here through the drift, but also cleaning ourselves. We had showers, washed our hair. I mean, this is serious stuff because they want absolutely no particles of dust to be in the experimentation labs. The most challenging story I've tackled scientifically has been the quantum computing story. It took a while to actually get my head around it and it actually took a recce. So we had to go and meet the professor beforehand before we started filming. And that particular meeting with Professor Henzinger was so interesting, but also so mind boggling. He explained so many different analogies just to try and get me and my producer's head around the concept. Imagine you have the world's worst memory stick, a memory stick with only two bits, right? So imagine, for example, you write zero, 01 into your memory stick. Well, your memory stick is full, it's, it's done. Now imagine you have a quantum memory stick with two bits instead. In two quantum bits, I can simultaneously write in two quantum bits zero, 00, zero, 01, 10, zero, and one one, and that all at the same time. Now that doesn't really sound that impressive. So imagine for example, you have a memory stick with 100 bits. I can write in one 100 bit number into my memory stick. But in a quantum memory stick, so if I have 100 quantum bits, now that's the number of different numbers I can encode into this quantum memory stick. So you can see how massively large the number of different numbers as I can encode into these just 100 quantum bits. According to quantum physics, things can be in two different places at the same time. This phenomenon is called superposition and can actually be observed in the laboratory where single atoms or subatomic particles can be shown to be in two separate places at once. I thought I got my head around the concept, but actually on the train journey home, I was like, actually, I don't understand this, which is exactly what quantum computing is like, because you can be here and there at the same time. And just like quantum, I understood it and completely was baffled by it all at the same time. This is a full scale quantum computer. So let's start here, the most important gadget, which is the vacuum system and produces a vacuum which is much better than the vacuum in outer space. So if you step out of a space shuttle, you have a lot more air to breathe than in, if you were to be inside oh, wow. one of these vacuum systems. The way this quantum computer operates is a little bit like a game of Pac-Man, where each atom levitates and moves across the surface of this microchip, then meets a second or third or fourth atom and undergoes logical computations so logical gates, we call them. A sequence, a series of many logical gates give now rise to an algorithm which then allows us to solve a really, really difficult problem. Renewable energy from the sun is a great source of electricity, but it's very difficult to store it, which is why we're so reliant on fossil fuels like petrol. But what if you could harness the power of the sun with the storability and reliability of liquid fuels? I've come to Cambridge to meet some researchers 
who claim they have done just that. And it's all been inspired by nature. The artificial leaf story actually was the most demanding shoot that I was on because not only was I self-producing, but the actual idea of it, the scientific idea of it, and trying to catch all of that through filming was really challenging. Um, I'm so glad that we hired a macro lens, which meant that we could really get into the detail of the actual technical hardware. But I found that shoot pretty tough because not only was I trying to get my head around it and therefore be enthused by this amazing piece of technology that they had developed, but I was also trying to capture the smallness of the experiment whilst at the same time trying to communicate the massive impact it will have on the way we consume and generate energy. You can clearly see bubbles of hydrogen and carbon monoxide forming in these test tubes. And what's so exciting is that those are the key ingredients of liquid fuels that we may be using one day. The experiment's tiny, but the environmental impact could be huge. The super laser story was an interesting one because we had expectations of what we were going to film and we went all the way to Romania. It was one of our first shoots of the series. So we were quite inexperienced in how we do things on razor and uh, there was a lot to learn scientifically but also in terms of how do we tell this story when the magic of what's happening can't really be seen so the way we tell the science and how it ties into a bigger picture and the visual effects of getting into yet another lab coat and now, when I look back, it's actually one of my favourite stories. This is where the lasers are. This is not like lasers in the movies. Let me give you an idea of the scale of this place. There are two lasers here, one on each side, and they're each pulsing 10 petawatts. It's just amazing. The best bit about the laser story was meeting Gerard Maru because he's a Nobel Prize winning physicist and it felt like an absolute privilege to be able to meet someone so eminent within STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. And so meeting Gerard Maru was one of the highlights of my career and certainly a highlight on Razor. Well, light is really, uh, of course, you know, very an ingredient of our lifetime. I mean, without light, there is no life. We still don't know how light propagates. You know, the light propagates in vacuum, and it's not like sound. The sound doesn't propagate in vacuums. And a vacuum is a building block, you know of what you are. Life moves pretty fast. Ideas move at the speed of sound. Technology moves at the speed of light. If you don't filter out the noise, you might miss the details. We pay attention to the details because they matter. Showing you a different perspective. See the difference. Marathon was the very first shoot we did for Razor and it was almost like a bit of an experiment because new team, new way of working and so we were just getting up to speed with doing that and it turned out to be a really fun shoot where we got to see everyone's talents shine through in terms of the film crew but we also got to see a bunch of very young people coming together to figure out solutions for future mobility and transportation. 
And so, again, it was an opportunity to tap into the passion and enthusiasm for engineering and see innovation and ingenuity all on that one day. And then to hear from the person who's running the Eco Marathon was also very inspiring because he has such a vision for trying to find new novel ways of moving around and you know whether that's electric or hydrogen or just using fuel that we have efficiently again it's it was a day that we documented where they are trying to push the boundaries of transportation forward so i've just been asked if i want a prototype or an urban concept car and i get to choose I want this one. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In front? Like yeah, that. you need to get your feet as far as you can. Okay. Not to 60 in 10 minutes. printer yes so in this printer the material will be driven by pressure green electronics was quite a tough film to make because um, what started out as this fantastically novel way of reproducing circuit boards using very sustainable materials actually started drifting off into a story about trying to recapture and recycle the elements in circuit boards. So there were two different types of thinking um, and technology involved in the story. And so trying to capture those two and tie them together was a little bit tricky. The cloudy solution, woo, getting splashed. The cloudy solution that's in this big bowl is being sucked into this machine here and two stones that are very close to each other are responsible for grinding this solution into an even finer solution. But as it goes through the process of being ground down, those fibers are going to become so small on a nano scale that actually this liquid is going to become clear. What it communicated and what it taught me was that there are different ways of tackling the same problem. And that's something that comes up in Razor all the time, is that there's a problem and quite a number of ways of solving that problem. And often with films, you have to choose one way that you're gonna tell the story. And so with Green Electronics, it was a story about sustainable circuit boards and a story about recycling um, electronic waste. And so the conundrum was, how do you tie those two things together? And I think in the end we got there, but it was a bit of a challenge on that journey. So much of our electronic waste ends up in landfill. And so precious metals like this gold dust is lost forever. But thanks to the research being done in Zurich, that may not be a problem in our future. I'm here at the Cullum Centre for Fusion Energy where they have the world's largest tokamak and I'm hoping that today they're going to generate plasma for real. So where are we going? We're going to Invesel training facility. Well, there's so much happening here yes. today. We are starting the preparation of a very important experiment. Actually, one of the most important experiments we're going to ever carry out the jet. Nuclear fusion was, again, a very fascinating story to cover on Razor. And for me, it was an absolute privilege to be able to go to this giant experiment that's been constructed in France and see it just coming together. I mean, it's been years in the making and there's years to go. But to be able to really understand what they're doing there in Marseille is deeply fascinating, not just from a scientific point of view, but the fact that they're able to construct something so ambitious. So here we come into the tokamak pit, and this is where you appreciate the scale of the tokamak. 
this entire space will be full from ground to ceiling with the tokamak. It will be a stainless steel vessel called the cryostat which will completely fill the space on the outside and then inside it will be super cooled down to 80 Kelvin so nearly to minus 200 degrees and the entire tokamak will sit inside this space so you will never be able to come here. So here exactly where we'll be standing will be extremely cold and then just like a little bit up there, zero. yeah below absolute yeah almost absolute zero and then as you just go up there in the middle you imagine it'll be 100 million degrees so the temperature gradient between almost my hand and where we are will be is a part of the challenge of making a tokamak work we also went to jet in oxford to see a mini version of that happening and the idea of putting those two things together in the same film really hit home that nuclear fusion could be a very effective solution to providing sustainable energy for a growing population. This really is the future. Is it safe? Yeah, in you come. You can go. Looks like you can right. go in. Go but there is a scale replica used for training purposes. Oh, incredible. This is the tokamak. This is real copy of the actual machine. This is actually to the scale of the jet machine, and this is as close as you can be of being inside a real tokamak. I get to meet a huge amount of scientists, technologists, very technical people, all working passionately in their fields. And what I've noticed about all of them is that they are so consumed with their work, and they're so deeply invested in advancing technology. So whether it's a biology story or a chemistry story or physics or engineering, they really have dedicated their lives to doing what they do. And I love the fact that on Razor we can tap into that. Why is it so important to get this knowledge? It's purely from understanding it on, on, its, on its basic level. We want to understand the universe as well as we can and learn a little bit more about you know, the history of us, why we exist, why our solar system exists is because of this mysterious matter. The galaxy wouldn't have formed without it. Dark matter is only a part of, a, of a, it's the, the far-reaching goal. Getting, getting it to work, getting a detector to work, putting things together. That was the first time a cryostat made of pure acrylic was made. We were convinced it could work, but we were the only one that way. Right now the field is open, you, you, can, you can keep digging. It's our jobs to be able to distill or translate their very complex worlds into something we can all appreciate. But what really unites all these different people that I get to meet is their passion for their work. And I always get infected by that. I, it's why I love my job. Glove? I'm no stranger to personal protective equipment or PPE, but this outfit has got to be the most colorful yet. This is all in the name of going through a mine. Okay, I think I'm ready to spend 10 hours underground. I've now come to the point where I totally accept that on most shoots I'm going to be wearing a lab coat of some description. And I've had blue ones, white ones, even red ones, and um, it's now just part of the job because often the stories I cover, they're really sensitive, fragile experiments, and so we have to get suited up for it. And now it's just loads of fun. So I'm about to head into a clean scientific laboratory. I've got, I'm standing on sticky pads, which is gonna collect the dust because any kind of filaments in the room could scatter the laser. It's that precise, so. I'm going to have to uh, get suited up. So I'm going over to the clean side. I must say I'm pretty nervous about having this jet suit strapped to me because um, I have no experience and uh, everything seems quite dangerous, but I really want to feel what it's like to fly because I think it's just an exceptional experience. I wish I could do all of my stories again because when I'm actually there at the time, I'm 
discovering and feeding off the enthusiasm of the scientists. And then I want to go back and kind of look at the story again, but kind of knowing and having that expertise that you get through making these films. But one that springs to mind is the jet suit story. I'm sorry, the idea that jet engines are allowing you to hover in the air. I get the mechanics, I get the theory. It all stacks up from an engineering point of view, but to actually be able to hover in the air like that, I'm gonna to have to do it to believe it. I had a go at trying on the jet suit, and I must say that fear was really in me. The idea of having fuel strapped to my back was just terrifying. But after my first go, I immediately wanted a second go because the idea of flying using the equivalent of two sports cars strapped on your arms was just amazing. And I would have loved to have been able to just lift off the ground but instead I was harnessed and I was kind of a bit more cautious keeping my toes touching the floor. At this point, I'm glad I'm attached to a harness. So clearly I need a bit more practice, but for my first attempt, it really hit home how hard it is to gain control over the engines, and they were at their lowest setting. Actual liftoff was probably gonna take a few more attempts and a lot more courage. He did it for you. <laughs> Get the weight up here, yeah? yeah. How was that? That was crazy, awesome! Huh? I'm shaking like a leaf. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's exhilaration or just terror. It, there's all these thoughts going through your mind, yeah. like, am I absolutely nuts to be doing yeah, this? Yeah, absolutely, that's very common. Yeah, Plus, that. you know, when I think about the fuel and I think about the power yeah. that I've got attached to me, yeah. And it's kind of humbling because you realise that you're just, you're not. They don't look like they do much, fly. do they? They're little, little metal tins, and yet the amount of kind of power and noise. Yeah, the noise, force. Yeah, the force. Yeah. And like the knowledge that a slight movement yeah. could send you spinning. People should watch Razor because I don't think there is any other show on the air that tells science the way we do. We tell science in a way that is really respecting their passion and interest in the work that these scientists and technologists do. But at the same time, we're accurate and we're factual and we try and stick to the complexity whilst at the same time communicating it in a way that's accessible, non-intimidating. We often take people on a journey. The hosts of the show become so enthused by the work that's being done by other people. And it's beautiful to watch. It's shot in such a cinematic way, but yet it's so real and down to earth. And nobody's doing science the way we do science on Razor. And that's why people should watch it. In order to control these quantum effects, you need to go out of your way to build technology capable of manipulating individual atoms. So none of that is going to be be very small or very easy to use, but it's going to be unbelievably powerful. And this is what quantum computers are really all about, allowing us to solve problems you could never even dream about solving before. I would absolutely do it for free, but don't <laughs> hold me to that. I need to keep a roof over my head. But no, I would absolutely do it for free. I actually do do this in my spare time because I'm always so fascinated to know what people are doing scientifically and particularly in engineering. And so not only do I get to do what I normally do, but I end up being able to share it on a platform where everyone can appreciate. There's still a long way to go, but the journey so far has already taught us so much. If they ever do find dark matter, there's still the small issue of understanding dark energy, an entity that in theory fills 70% of our universe. But that's another story.